Consistory and Deacons. Oh, so, uh, the, on behalf of Consistory and Deacons, we extend a warm welcome to all guests and members to our worship service today. This morning, we, we have the following announcements. Council will meet with the congregation, Lord willing, Tuesday, March 7th at 7.30 p.m. Classes Niagara will be convened, Lord willing, March 15th at the Living Light Canadian Reformed Church at Grimsby. The offertory for both services will be for word and deed. We welcome Dr. Visser to the pulpit this morning. May the Lord give you wisdom and strength for the task of proclaiming his holy word. May his name be glorified and praised in our worship as we gather and begin a new week. Let us rise for worship. Brothers and sisters, as we come before the Lord this morning, let us profess our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Receive God's greeting, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise God together with the words of Psalm 86, stanzas 1 and 2. Brothers and sisters, it's good for us to reflect on who we are as we come before God and worship. We are the people who have received much and offer Him a life of gratitude, and we are the people who still need to confess our sins and transgressions, and for that purpose we use the words of the covenant. Now, the most common word in the Ten Words of the Covenant and the Ten Commandments is the word not could give us the impression that it's only about the things we should avoid. But our catechism actually is very careful to show there are not only things we should avoid, there are also things that we should do. There's not only a negative side, there's not only the knots, there's also the positive side. You might imagine, for instance, that you never break the Eighth Commandment. 
because you never steal anything from anybody else. But the Eighth Commandment is pretty broad and wide. It even covers something like the offerings we have this morning. So when we actually string together the interpretation of the catechism from the positive side, uh, we have lots of challenges before us and lots of ways in which we still need to develop uh, the Christian life before us. First of all, the first commandment reads, you should have no other gods but me. The catechism says it also means that I should rightly come to know the only true God. Trust in Him alone. Submit to Him with all humility and patience. Expect all good from Him only and love, fear, and honor Him with all my heart. Second commandment says you should have no images before God. But on the positive side, the catechism says he wants his people to be taught, not by means of dumb images, but by the living preaching of the word. The third one says we shouldn't take the name of God in vain. Doesn't mean we should, we are full finished when we haven't done that. Because there are times when we should also use the name of God. Uh, the Catechism says we must use the holy name of God only with fear and reverence so that we may rightly confess Him, call upon Him, and praise Him in all our words and works. The Catechism only has positive things to say about the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day that especially on the day of rest I diligently attend the church of God to hear God's word, to use the sacraments, to call publicly upon the Lord, and to give Christian offerings for the poor. Second, that all the days of my life I rest from my evil works. Let the Lord work in me through his Holy Spirit and so begin in this life the eternal Sabbath. The fifth commandment is about honoring your father and mother. It's not only about not giving them a bad answer, a bad attitude. It says I show that I show all honor, love, and faithfulness to my father and my mother and to all those in authority over me. Submit myself with due obedience to their good instruction and discipline and also have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings, since it is God's will to govern us by their hand. The sixth commandment, you shall not kill, also means he commands us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to show patience, peace, gentleness, mercy, and friendliness towards him, to protect him from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. The seventh, you shall not commit adultery. Since we, our body and soul, are temples of the Holy Spirit, it's God's will that we keep ourselves pure and holy. The Eighth Commandment, you shall not steal, also means I must promote my neighbor's good wherever I can and may. Deal with him as I would uh, like others to deal with me and, and work faithfully so that I may be able to give to those in need. The ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness. Not only you shall not lie, tell falsehoods, I must love the truth, speak and confess it honestly, and do what I can to defend and promote my neighbor's honor and reputation. The tenth commandment, you shall not covet, reaches to our hearts, as the Catechism also says, with all our heart we should always hate all sin and delight in all righteousness. In the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, very positively, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your might. This is the great and first commandment, and the second one is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us praise God with the words of Psalm 86, stanzas 3 and 4.
Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, almighty, glorious God, we thank and praise your holy name indeed for the privilege of coming before you, for the privilege of fellowshipping not only with each other, but with you, first of all. You are the one who creates our fellowship. You create our lives. You create our everything about us, and we thank and praise you uh, for all your gifts and also this gift that we enjoy this day. And we pray that you would bless us in this. We pray that you would receive our worship and our praise, our offerings, our everything, that we might be directed to you, your glory and praise, and that we might do that not just this day or this hour, but we might do that throughout our lives also in this week. In all things, thinking not only about what we can get away with, like immature children, but thinking about how we can please you as children who love you and want to serve you and live for you and give you the glory and the praise and the honor because it's all due to you. Most gracious God, we ask for your blessing as we read your word, as your word is proclaimed and applied to our hearts and lives, and may we be blessed as we live it out in our lives. We gather together before you in the realization and the recognition that whenever we gather together before you, we gather with your church above in the heavenly courts. We gather also united with your people around the globe. And we know that your people around the globe are disturbed by many things. And we think of Turkey and we think of Syria and we think of the Ukraine and we think of China and other areas of the world. If your people are not affected by illness, then they're affected by war and they're affected by persecution. Most gracious God, Lead us to the better day when none of this will be there anymore. But instead, there will be peace and there will be joy and there will be people who just want to serve you and serve you entirely, not only in terms of seizing the negative, but also accenting the positive, giving you all the worship and all the glory that you so deserve. Most gracious God, look upon us in your love and Forgive us our sins, wash us white with the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for they are many, and continue to work in us by the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your work of justification. We pray that you would continue to your, with your precious work of sanctification in the expectation of the glorious day when the glorification will even be ours. Hear us in Jesus' name in the forgiveness of all our sins. Amen. We'd like to open Scripture this morning, first of all from Acts 21, and then from Ephesians 2, Acts 21. The Apostle Paul is in Jerusalem. And you have to realize as we read this, they see Paul as somewhat weak because of his supposed compromise with Gentiles like us. His willingness to allow Gentiles to access the grace of God. And so they suspect something about him as he goes into the temple. Let's read the passage. Acts 21, verse 27. Hear the word of the Lord. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Israel was in confusion. 
He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob followed, mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. This is the word of the Lord. Then we turn also to Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll read from verses 1 to 10, a passage which I have recently preached here in this place, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10. Hear the word of God. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The word of the Lord. We pause there. We praise God with the words of Psalm 102, stanzas 1, 6, 7, and 8. <clears throat>
This morning, I may proclaim to you the Word of God as we find that in Ephesians 2, the verses 11 through 22. Hear the Word of God, Ephesians 2, verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man (coughs) in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. (coughs) Excuse me. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. After the proclamation of God's word, we'll praise God with the words of hymn 52, stanzas 1, 2, and 4. Beloved congregation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, one thing that has surprised me in the recent years is the degree to which the word missional is considered to be somewhat controversial. I suppose it comes about because the word is somewhat new, and so immediately people are suspicious of it. What's up now? And I suppose, too, that different people mean different things by it. But I take it, however, to mean that missions and evangelism ought always to be a high priority among the people of God. That the goal of the church is not just to be a a social club of like-minded people, but to be a body that effectively communicates to the people of its community in a language and a manner that draws them into the power of the gospel and into the saving message of our Lord Jesus Christ. To me, the great challenge before the Canadian Forum Churches, the Federation, between now and the day of the Lord returns, is to do on the home front the kind of things that we have been doing in Brazil, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and all those other places. The simple fact is, and this is changing in our day, the majority of the unreached peoples of the world are not in faraway places. They are here in our nation, especially in the urban centers. And the great challenge is to be as passionate and as focused about reaching out to them here as we are on what we used to call the mission fields. The truth is the whole world is a mission field today. And Christians and Christian people alone have what it takes to get people on to the better world that's coming. I don't believe that when our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew 28, gave us the Great Commission, he was only speaking about something the church would do once in a while in a pet project or an optional task or far away from its own doors. Rather, he was talking about an aspect of being church that was to be at the core, the heart, and the purpose of church. The challenge of this commission is for the church to be as effective at both making disciples of all nations and teaching obedience to everyone about the things that Jesus has commanded. The church is often compared to a mother 
especially in the language of John Calvin. Well, then this mother is to be as eager to welcome new children into her home as she is to nurture the children she already has. The task of the church is to preserve and increase. She is to look both within and without. So what does it take to make a church such? What does it take to turn this missional nature up a number of notches? For one, a tremendous insight into the nature of the love command, the Ten Commandments again. To truly love our neighbors as we love ourselves. It's often said that the church has to go be focused upward, inward, and outward. All three always matter. Everything is lost if we don't have the upward focus, but much is lost as well if we don't have an outward focus. And perhaps along with those insights, we also need an appreciation for the many things the Apostle Paul says in the passage before us this morning. God's Word comes to you under this theme. The Apostle Paul proclaims that Christ is the peace of the people of God. We'll talk about our Gentile past, our peacemaking Savior, and our Christian present. Brothers and sisters, with this part of the second chapter of Ephesians, it's again for a challenge for us to realize that Paul is really speaking about us. If you, like me, have grown up in a Christian home where you have heard the gospel uh, since you were knee-high, praise God, but then you might think, as I often have, that this particular chapter is not speaking to me. You might so say, I have no such Gentile past to remember or to turn from. There never really was an extended period of time in which Jesus Christ was some foreigner to me, although I do remember wondering about the gospel in the first year of my university education. But I have no great conversion story, so we think let's move on to the next chapter. But wait a minute. When I dealt with the first part of this chapter, maybe you remember, it's slim chance, we came to the realization that for Paul there are only two categories. You are either Jew or you are Gentile. You are either of Jewish stock or you are of Gentile stock. Yes, children born to believing parents become covenant children, and the promises are to them. (coughs) But they're still either Jewish or Gentile, and if you're not Jewish, then you're Gentile. The covenant doesn't make you Jewish. He makes the point there that all people, Jew or Gentile, of themselves are dead in sin. We don't just need a bit of help. We are dead, objects of wrath by ourselves. It's Romans 1, 2, and 3. There is no one righteous, not even one, Jew or Gentile. Help only comes because of Ephesians 2, verse 3, but God. And here too, Paul is now addressing those Gentiles, and most of them are first-generation converts And therefore, he speaks as he does. But I I don't believe he, for a moment, for a moment that Paul is writing this text just for people with dramatic conversion stories, just for people who have a lot of baggage and evil in their past. The passage, whether it's speaking to first-generation Gentile Christians or 10th-generation Christians, is calling on all of us to think about where we would be without God's grace in our lives. And so he's saying to you, regardless of who, of you or your grandfather or your great-grandmother or whoever put you on this blessed Christian path, to think about this. Where would you be without Christ? You have to realize that the Apostle Paul is the perfect person to write about this here. On the one hand, he's born of Jewish parents. He could say, I'm not included in this. He's a Jew, clearly. On the other hand, in the the first part of his life, he's been so anti-Christian, persecuting the Christians, and has lived away from Israel long enough to come across as as a Roman, as a Gentile. For us, it may be a bit more difficult to see ourselves as Gentiles because most of us have been part of a Christian community for as long as we can remember. And yet... Most children of believing parents, most of us have had moments and periods in our lives when we were not so sure about the Christian faith. 
Every generation needs to take hold of it and pull. And Paul is not just saying, remember that you once lacked some knowledge about God, but he's saying, remember that you were once far from him, alienated from him, without faith. Where were you then, and where would you be today if you continued on that path? He's calling on all of us to appreciate all our present blessings by reflecting on where we would be today if the grace didn't come into the life of your grandparents or your parents or your life. Because every successive generation has to affirm it in faith. He's saying, verse 12, remember that apart from Christ, the Almighty God would be against us. Apart from God, we would be storing up wrath for the day of judgment. Paul piles them all up here. In chapter 1, he has listed all the great blessings that, that come to those who are in Christ in those majestic early long sentences. But here he piles up all the shortcomings, the disabilities of those who are unconverted Gentiles. Separated from Christ, he says. Separated from Christ. Verse 12. And that must mean separate from all the blessings because the Savior, the Messiah, is just this enigmatic figure who died a ridiculous death one day in history. That's what we think in that state. Alienated from the citizenship in Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise. Israel was a nation under God, a theocracy, a people to whom God had committed himself That kingdom only gets stronger and stronger and more glorious under the reign of King Jesus. But the Gentiles were afar off because they were far from Christ and didn't know who he was. Having no hope and without God in the world, it says. This was the great disability of Gentiles in Paul's day, even when they didn't know it. Although God had revealed himself in in nature and not left them without a witness to himself, They suppress that truth, Paul says in Romans 1, and they turned to idolatry. The golden age of the Greeks was past. They had no promised future to look forward to. The gods of Greece and Rome failed to satisfy the hunger of human hearts. They had all these gods, but they had no God because they didn't know Jesus Christ. As one commentator summarizes that they were Christless, stateless, friendless, hopeless, and godless. And these have been the great disabilities of Gentiles ever since. Study the whole history of thought ever since. It's the same. Take God out of the equation. You have no answers. Civilizations civilizations rise and civilizations fall. Men hypothesize, philosophers theorize, one after the other, but without Christ, the conclusion of verse 12 is true without hope and without God. Without hope, it means no sense to life, no purpose today, no future to tomorrow, no real answers to the nature of life or death, hopeless, speechless, nothing to proclaim, nothing to sing about. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see it in our society. Why do people struggle with who they are and have turned sexuality into everything, the identifier of who you are? They don't know God. Why do we start talking about ending your life as soon as you feel some pain? Because they don't know God. Without God, you know nothing. No comfort in the face of life's greatest disappointments. And not only is there alienation and hostility with God, along with that, there comes hostility with people. Paul talks about that in verse 14. The barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. It might be an allusion to the fact that in the Jerusalem wall, in the Jerusalem temple of Paul's day, there was a court for the Gentiles with a small wall and a barrier, a balustrade, they called it, beyond which the Gentiles were never allowed to go past. The Jews could go so far. The Gentiles could go so far. There was this wall. Men might have, Paul might have that partially in mind when he writes about this dividing wall. You see something of that in our Acts 21 passage. Look what happens when the people think 
When the people of Jerusalem think that Paul might have taken Trophimus, an Ephesian Gentile, into the temple area, beyond the wall. The whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar, and they want to kill Paul. Paul is thinking about the hostility between Jew and Gentile, a tremendous tension of his day. The biggest social question of early Christianity was this question, how can we, all these Jewish people, allow all these Gentile things and Gentile customs and Gentile practices into the church today? Problem number one in the early Christian church, the idea that Gentiles might be included, never mind the things that Gentiles do. Paul's probably also alluding to that long history in verse 11 when he says, <coughs> Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles were called uncircumcised by what is called circumcised. It's a bit of a complex phrase. He's just saying, remember there was a day the, the Jews called you Gentiles uncircumcised people. Think of how David spoke of Goliath, that uncircumcised Philistine or Saul about his enemies, those uncircumcised fellows. That's life without Christ. Alienation from God, alienation from people, racial prejudice, name-calling, walls of division all over the place. Over history, there's a multiplication of these walls. Berlin Wall, iron, bamboo curtains, barriers of race, color, tribe, class. Think of the concrete wall cutting through Israel today as it divides Jews from Palestinians. Divisiveness is a constant characteristic of every community without Christ, even to the point where people will go to war and die over some or the other senseless division. That, says Paul, is where we would be if God didn't enter our lives, resurrect us from our deadness to Him, and give us both the will to believe and the faith that embraces Him in Christ. And then, and when Paul says twice in the NIV, verse 11 and verse 12, remember that you formerly were Gentiles. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. What is he doing? Is he just saying that we should keep this in our minds, have some recollection about this? No, no. You have to remember, you have to think about that word, remember a long, a long history as well. What does it mean when God says to Israel, Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Or remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert those 40 years to humble you and test you. Or remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to produce wealth. Or what does it mean when God says to God, when Job says to God, Remember, O oh God, my life is but a breath. It means to so remember this to the depth of your being, to your heart of hearts, that the past that you do remember affects and changes your present. That's what God was talking about again and again, the need for Israel not just to acknowledge a historical fact somewhere in their brains, but to let that fact influence and control what they are and who they are now. So too Paul. He's not just talking about some brain knowledge and intellectual recollection. He means let the memory seize you and move you. Feel the plight you have been saved from. Ponder the realities you have been saved from. Unrelenting guilt, meaningless existence, omnipotent justice against you, and eternal punishment. That was what it was about. Remember that every day of your lives. Lay the Scriptures before you and skip no verses. All have sinned and gone astray. Far off, guilty, condemnable. And then as you go through life and see the misery of this world, the physical and emotional suffering of every division, every disturbance, every abnormality, every wickedness, and every deterioration of life as God meant it to be, as you see every case say, there but for the absolute free an unmerited grace of God, go I. Doesn't that make you more aware of the need to share the gospel with those who still are in the midst of that? Imagine a man who's shipwrecked with hundreds of other people and they're all floating in the Atlantic Ocean, desperately hanging on, and this big cruise ship comes along and just picks him up. 
And he gets on the ship. And he goes and showers and shaves and eats and drinks and is merry. And meanwhile forgets about all those other people who were in the water. Didn't bother to lend a helping hand to those who were floating. Why? Because he's so selfish, so in the grips of unbelief, he does not remember that was him. Imagine the man in Matthew 18 who has just been relieved of a, of a debt of millions of dollars meets the man who owes him a couple hundred bucks and grabs him by the throat. Why? He doesn't remember his own past. Imagine the whole history of Israel where they're constantly slipping back into the very same patterns God has delivered them from in the past. Why did they do that? Because they didn't remember. To remember is to have such an awareness of the past that you have been spared from that that remembrance shapes and transforms your present as well as your future. You see every other sinner differently. That could be me. You see your life differently because you remember. Why does the Lord Jesus, ascended Lord Jesus, complain very strikingly to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2? You have forsaken your first love. Why is it that there is this spiritual inertia that develops as Christians move through the generations? When is it that lukewarmness sets in so that the gospel no longer excites? Why is it that there's a temptation to become less and less missional from the day, uh, further away, the further we are removed from the day of our conversion ourselves or the conversion of our ancestors? When we fail to remember that this is who we once were and there's only one small but yet great thing that separates us from them, namely the grace of God. There are some things scriptures tell us to forget, sins of youth, sins and hurts of others, but there's one thing that we are commanded to remember and never forget, namely that we, what we were before God's love reached down and found us, they go hand in hand. If we remember our former alienation, we also remember, remember the grace which God forgave us and is transforming us day by day. And so that's our second point, our peacemaking Savior. For again, just as in verse 4, we have that great explanation. But God, now in verse 13, we have another explanation. Remember, but now in Christ, verse 13, but now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ, says Paul, is the answer to all this division of the host and hostility between Jew and Gentile. He is our peace. How? Well, first, Paul refers, uh, Paul has three things in mind. First of all, Paul refers in verse 15 to the laws, commandments, and ordinances, uh, regulations. The reference seems to be especially to the ceremonial law, to circumcision, to the sacrifices, the dietary regulations, and all the rules about cleanness and uncleanness which govern relationships. All of this erected a serious barrier between Jews and Gentiles, but all of this was abolished when Jesus Christ offered up the supreme sacrifice of himself. And, and, and Paul is showing to the, to the church at his time, this is why he gets so opposed, because Paul is showing the effects of that abolition, the, the changes that, that Christ's death made for the people and for this division. Paul's not saying that the law is abolished as a moral guide. In chapter 6, verse 2, he gives us his version of the, sixth, of the fifth commandment, and it's beautiful. <coughs> but what is abolished is the law as a set of regulations that excludes all Gentiles. Notice that Paul says in verse 15, he abolished it in his flesh. The problem had very much to do with the flesh of Jews and Gentiles, so the solution is found in the flesh of Jesus. He takes the hostility of both Jews and Gentiles into himself, and when he died, that hostility had to die and did die right then and there. 
Secondly, Paul is thinking of all the sins of those Jews and Gentiles who were without Christ. Gentiles are brought near through the blood of Jesus, verse 13. It's through Him and His atonement on the tree of the cross that both Jew and Gentile have something amazing, verse 18. Access in one spirit to the Father. Jews and Gentiles. Access to the one Father. Only because Jesus himself perfectly obeyed the law in his life and in his death bore all the consequences of our disobedience do we have reconciliation and access to God. Disobedient Jews and disobedient Gentiles through faith by grace can come forth because every manner of obedience has been offered in the person and the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And every manner of disobedience has been atoned for. And thirdly, Paul says, Christ did something else that's amazing, and he uses the concept of creation to describe it. He says in verse 15 that Christ brought Jew and Gentile together by a sovereign act of creation. He created in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace, and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Number one social problem in early Christianity, the tension between Jew and Gentile, put to death, put to death their hostility. It's over. So close is the connection of the church to Christ that she already appears in the cross as a new creation, the one redeemed humanity. He took these two groups of humanity that had been so opposed to each other, made them parts of himself, and made a single entity out of them. Jews and Gentiles are incorporated into Christ, and when he is raised to a new life, a new being comes into existence one in which people are one with Christ and one with each other in Him. No more barriers. Whatever race, whatever color, whatever tribe, whatever tongue you speak, no more difference. All are one in Christ. What does it mean? Well, when you think about Acts 21, Paul is, as it were, saying... I didn't take Trophimus into the temple. But so what if I did? Even if I did bring Trophimus into the temple, do you not understand the full significance of the death of Jesus Christ? That division is down, gone. Take away the balustrade. Take away all the walls. They're gone. Thinking of you and me, it means we too, Gentiles, can be included and are included in the life of Christ and the church and the world that he is making. It means now the church can be truly missional, putting forth the message to those far and those near, making disciples of all nations. You see, if there is one little ounce of racism in your body, then you've got a problem because you know what? In the perfect world, in the new heaven and the new earth, every race, every tribe, every tongue, all those people will be there. All racial prejudice is gone forever. White or black, Hispanic or Chinese, it matters not a whit. Black lives matter, all lives matter, because this is where we came from, out of the body of Jesus Christ, and this is where we're going, into the world in which the church will be forever, many-colored, many-tongued, multiracial. You better get used to it. This new unity through and in Christ does even more than span the Jew-Gentile divide. Colossians 3, verse 11, Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Galatians 3, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean all differentiation is removed. Men remain men. Women remain women. We'll have less problem with that if we realize it's not sex that's the great identifier. It's Jesus. We are one in Christ. Canadians remain Canadians. 
Koreans remain Korean, but all inequality is abolished. There's a new unity in the body of Christ. And so we see, thirdly, our Christian present. What is the point? Well, Paul says there are consequences to what Christ has done. Verse 19, so then. And he says there are three consequences. It shapes the church. You are no longer strangers and aliens, he says, but fellow citizens with the saints. In other words, they're no longer excluded from Israel. The word citizen suggests he's talking about them as members of the kingdom of God. Strikingly, there's this one kingdom as he speaks, as he writes. There's this one kingdom called Rome with all its glory. And, this sh- and, and there's this other kingdom, this, this shattered kingdom of Israel. But the death of Christ is such that not only do the, all those who believe in him become one, they become jointly members of another kingdom, neither Jewish nor Roman, but international and international, interracial, even more splendid and more enduring than any earthly empire. It's called the kingdom of God. And Paul rejoices in that even more than he rejoices in his Roman citizenship. Here they belong. Here they are at home in the kingdom of God. And he says, not only are they citizens of that kingdom, they're also members of the household of God. Members of the household of God. What does it mean? It means they're part of the family of God. Here they all have access to the Father. One of the great privileges of the redeemed, said Paul back in 1 verse 5, is that we are adopted to be God's sons and daughters through Christ. One of the things he will glory in later is that there is one God and one Father of us all. But notice it's all because of Christ's sacrifice. You have nothing to say about who's brought into this kingdom or this family. You had nothing to say about what family you were brought in. You're in the same family. You're brothers and sisters because you have one father, one mother. Well, it's the same thing with God. You have nothing to say about this. If you know this father, if you know Christ, you're amazed to find how many brothers and sisters you have. All that's left to you is to greet and accept other people into God's kingdom and God's family and don't create any barriers because Jesus Christ gave his blood to get away with the barriers, do them away. And there's even a third privilege, a third status that you and they receive, verse 20 to 22. In him, the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord a holy temple in the Lord. It's striking when you think about it. Not only do God's people in Christ become a new nation and a new family, they become a new temple. Think about it. As Paul is writing this, over in Ephesus, there's a magnificent marble temple dedicated to Artemis. Acts 19. It was one of the ancient seven wonders of the world with its statue of this goddess. While Paul is writing, there's another temple too over there in Jerusalem. It still stands in Paul's day. Rebuilt by Herod the Great, barricading itself against all the Gentiles and now also against God. It had been the dwelling place of God for centuries, but now it's irrelevant. Long before the Romans come and destroy it. Two temples, one pagan, the other Jewish, each designed as a divine residence, but both empty of the living God. Because now, says Paul, in Jesus Christ, in the body of Jesus Christ, there is a new temple, a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It is His new society, His redeemed people scattered throughout the world. They are His home on this earth. It's not yet complete. It rises, it grows to become a holy temple in the Lord. This is your privilege, says Paul in verse 22. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You are being built into it by the Spirit. But the thing to notice with each of these images is how each one is deliberately more intense than the one before. 
There's a kingdom with its king and its citizens. A king lives in a country with his people. And there's a family that's more intimate with its father and its children. And, and a father lives under the same roof with his children. And then there's a temple. And God actually lives in the temple. He lives in us. He lives in you. It never becomes more intense than that. What you see is the exact opposite of what happens when we're outside of Christ. When we're outside of Him, there's disunity, there's division, there's hatred, there are walls, there is hostility. Why would you bring anybody into that? But when we're in Christ, there's a new safe haven into which everyone can be brought and everyone can find refuge and everyone will be welcome. That's why the most powerful force in the whole world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's more powerful than how your country or your culture has shaped you, more powerful than how your family has shaped you. Remember this, to be non-Christian is to be driven to disunity and enmity, but to be Christian is to be called to deep relationship, deep involvement in Christian community, deep involvement in the life of God. All who are shaped by the gospel are bound to each other more powerfully than they are shaped by any other force in their lives. We are one. We are united to each other. And it all happens not because of you, but because of, our, because of Christ. And in Christ, our peace. If you know him, if you truly know him, you're going to grow in oneness with all kinds of people. How does all that happen? Think of it. Our Lord Jesus Christ was the king, the son of David. But his own people didn't know him. They treated him as the lowest of all citizens. They excommunicated him out of Israel. And he was the son. But they said, here's the son. Let's kill him. The son treated like an alien, a stranger, like one of us, so that we could be brought in. The son forsaken even by the father, forsaken defellowshipped so that we might be brought in, cursed that we might be blessed. And he was the temple. Destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. He's the cornerstone. In him the whole body is joined together and rises. But he in whom the fullness of God dwelt bodily is rejected and killed, the very son of God. He faced all the hostility, he faced all the rejection so that we might never live in hostility and never be rejected. Remember then what you once were. Remember, appreciate what you are now. Enjoy it. There's no place like this. And remember how you got here in Christ. And so bring them all in, realizing there's more room in this kingdom this household, this temple, there's more room in the heart of God. Amen.
Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, almighty, glorious God, we thank you for the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his life. We thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world and doing everything that we could not do. And so uniting us with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and uniting us also with each other. And we pray indeed for a, for a blessing on everything that continues to be done here with a view to the proclamation of the gospel, not only inside the church here, but also outside the church. And may we be living witnesses of the fact that our lives have changed and that the amazing thing is that the change comes about for free by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray for your blessing over all of this, and we pray for your blessing over our lives as we continue the journey that you have given us, the journey towards the, the new Jerusalem and, and the goal where the pains and the sorrows will be no more. We thank you this morning, along with the campstras, that they can enjoy their daughter and enjoy the sign and seal of baptism this afternoon. We pray for a blessing as, they're, as we're all mindful of what happens also in baptism. You extend your love and your grace and you want to impress it upon us. We uh, pray that you would continue to be with our brother Hank Vandervelde, and we thank you that he could return home, and we pray that you would give him the recovery uh, that he so needs because we acknowledge our lives are not just in the hands of doctors and medicine, our lives are in your hands. We owe you everything. And so we pray that you would be with uh, Hank and Emily and you would bless them in every way in this period of time. And we're mindful of our brother and sister, Bulky and Lindy, who are engaged to be married, and we pray that you would bless them in every way. May they prepare, not just for a day, but may they prepare for a, for a lifetime uh, together that will be lived to the praise of your holy name. And there is no greater basis to do that than the basis of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because you bring about unity like no one else can. Most gracious God, we commend into your care also our, the, the Alcama family, and we pray that you would continue to bless our sister Alcama in Ancaster and bless her, her, her family as they surround her with your care. We pray for a blessing over the radiation that she receives and that she might have a strength and, and every blessing as she goes through this process. We pray that you would also continue to bless the work of the calling committee, important task you know, to call someone who might lead your people in the ways of the glory of your holy name and the ways of the gospel. And we pray for a blessing over that work. We ask that discouragement might not set in, but instead there might be willingness to, to carry on with this task. We pray, uh, indeed, that you would be gracious to us in every possible way, bless our offerings, and be near, as we have prayed also before, to the people of Turkey and Syria. We ask for your blessing. What ruin, what devastation. Our hearts go out to them, and we pray for better days and for governments that will lead them to better days for you as the great governor of the universe. Hear us in Jesus' name in the forgiveness of all our sins. Amen. Well, also in connection with the Eighth Commandment, we have an offering. And thereafter, we sing together from hymn 69, stanzas 1, 2, and 3.
Receive now God's blessing and go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.